Great. So you were able to download Basilisk, get it installed, get it all to compile, get all the dependencies to be included and compiled. And now we're ready to actually run our first script. This video is going to talk you through this very basic orbit scenario. This is the simplest scenario that actually now uses spacecraft and some gravity body, and we do some orbits now. This assumes you've actually gone through the fundamentals of Basilisk already, where we talk about creating a process, a task, adding modules, connecting messages, recording messages, all those kinds of things. So you, if you haven't done that, first go through these lessons, the fundamentals. This one is basically orbit simulations. That's what we're going to be doing. So this is the web interface to it that you can find on the Basilisk documentation site. And um, what we're going to see in this simulation is we're going to create a Basilisk scenario, as we always do. So the Basilisk contains all the processes and tasks and modules. And we will make a spacecraft, and we're going to add a gravity effector, specifically Earth. And then we have to specify the spacecraft's position, velocity, create an orbit, log the data, plot it, and see how this all comes together. This would be a good example to see now how we make actually a spacecraft, how we connect things, how do you add gravity to a spacecraft? There's some subtleties there. What about the gravity? Which type of gravity? Do you include J2 or spherical harmonics or not? Um, for now, we're working on a single gravity body and you will see that subtlety as we get through that. Later on, there's examples where we have multiple gravity bodies and how that expands and scales. Um, so, to run the script, I always recommend making a copy of the script. You can put them in any folder and then you run it and it should run fine once Basilisk is installed. That way you can play with the script, change numbers, change the orbit, change the inclination and, and kind of play with this. So what does it look like when we run it? So I'm inside Basilisk examples. I type Python scenario basic orbit.py and this should run, just takes a few seconds. And you will see plots appearing. This is the orbit. And you can see how we kind of complete three quarters of an orbit. And these are my inertial orbit coordinates. Um, actually, these are the differences with respect to the truth. This is actually a validation. So you see I'm only off by a decimeter compared to a Keplerian answer. This is a function of your integration accuracy. This is what I was checking. These are the inertial coordinates. So you can get plots. Once you close them all, then the terminal process will complete. There's a nice optional feature here. You see when it was running, this one runs really fast, but it gave me a progress bar in a terminal. This is nice, um, not required, but if you have a simulation that runs a long time, it's really gratifying to see, oh yeah, it is doing something. The terminal hasn't just hung and nothing is happening anymore. It's actually working. It's just working silent in the background. But here it goes so quick, doesn't matter as much. Now I use PyCharm, so I'm gonna to switch to PyCharm here. And we're gonna look at scenario basic orbit and kind of walk and talk through the code. This is what I do in my workshops, talking about Basilisk here. So the top of the file is all just the RST documentation. We can ignore that. That's what you see on the website. So the real Python contents kind of starts here. You can see we're importing NumPy, matplotlib, uh, copy. We're trying to get the path for Basilisk um, that's needed for some saving, just some basic stuff that we have to do. The more Simulation specific things, we wanted to create a spacecraft module. So from spacecraft, that's a simulation one. So from base spacecraft, sorry, from <laughs> basilisk.simulation, we do import spacecraft. And then from basilisk.utilities, we include simulation base class. This is the one that we discussed in the fundamentals of Basilisk. This is essentially the core Basilisk framework where you create processes, tasks, manage who runs first, second, third, you know, priorities, all of that stuff. The macros, that's a kind of a support utility, helps us convert sometimes seconds to nanoseconds and has some other functions that are handy. You can take a look at it. Um, orbital motion, that's a support library we have. It helps take, you know, Cartesian position velocity and map them into orbit elements to go from orbit elements back to position velocity. And it has some other functions. That's kind of what we do there. Sim include graph body, that's a, another support library that we tend to use. Um, to create gravity bodies like Earth and the moon and so forth, and uh, how to add them and even how to include the, the JPL SPICE interface. SPICE will help you determine where is the Earth at this time. Um, you don't have to use SPICE, but that's kind of what we're doing there. So we'll use that. 
Unit test support, this is a kind of a general support library that we use. It has a lot of plotting things we like, uh, testing stuff. So it's, it's one that's used in the script. And this support, there is the companion program called Wizard that gives you a three-dimensional visualization of what your simulation did, which is kind of cool. You have to download it separately, but we can include that support library because then we can enable, if we want to, where all the data that we care about spacecraft, where's the earth, what's the attitude of the spacecraft and all that stuff will be recorded into a binary file that you can then load up, or we can also live stream and I'll show you both. So even though this is the simplest <laughs> spacecraft in orbit, that's it. No control, no sensors, no, no environments. It's just gravity and a spacecraft. You can see there's already quite a bit to talk about here. So this is a great script to get started. How do we write Basilisk scripts? Moving on down into our run, it's just our function. And here's some flags, because this, this uh, script can be run different ways. We can do as Earth-centric case. We can do a Mars-centric case. We can use spherical harmonics or not. I'm sorry, this is the Earth or Mars. I got it backwards. And then this leap orbit case, we can do either low Earth orbit or different kinds of orbits, um, like a geo or a GTO, a geostationary transfer orbit. Um, we can do a variety of things. So this is just, this demo scenario is set up that we can run it different ways very quickly. So you will see some if statements in the code. Um, that's why they're there. So I don't have six different scripts. I can have one script that does six different things. So let's go through it. From your fundamentals of Basilisk, you should be quite familiar with these steps. We're creating variable names just out of convenience as, an, as a variable instead of just a string that floats around. But there will be a single process and a single task in the simulation. So you could really call them Fred and Harriet, doesn't matter. Um, they just need names. Then we create an instance of our simulation base class, right? So every, sim every Basilisk simulation will have an instance of this. This is what controls the whole Basilisk framework, processes, tasks, stages them, calls update, calls reset, you know, initializes everything, um, records stuff, all that stuff. That's within simulation base class. If you're unfamiliar with this, go back and look at the fundamentals of Basilisk. The next line, this one is, we saw that progress bar in the terminal. This is what appeared here. So in SC Sim, you can set this with this method, set progress bar to true or false. And if true, it'll run this. By default, it's false. So you have to actively turn it on if you wanna have that progress bar. So here I did, this is a demo. It's a, it's a quick simulation, but it kind of shows what happens. Now, as you see in the fundamentals, I'm creating my Basilisk process. And then I'm adding a single task to that process. And the task is running at 10 seconds. And this is where I can use seconds to nano. So you don't have to remember how many zeros are in nanosecond. Um, you know, we can do that there and set our simulation time step. This will be handy, just for this recording it off. So we're doing a 10 second time step for an orbit. Yeah, it's okay with an RK4. This will, by default, you get a Rangikata fourth order fixed time step integrator. That's what we'll be having here. So all of this is standard stuff you've seen before. Now, where before the learning basilisk kept using these dummy modules that we were able to connect. These were C modules or C++ modules and some messages that you can just interconnect and arrange in different ways. Now we're actually gonna use real you know, space simulation modules. So our first one is spacecraft. This spacecraft module from Basilisk, it will give you the ability to solve the dynamical equations of a spacecraft that'll have three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. So it can have any attitude and any translation, always. Even if you don't specify attitude, it still has an attitude. It'll just be zero, zero, zero with respect to the inertial frame. Um, now, the next line, as we saw in fundamentals, every module we should give a unique name. So I'm calling it BSK hyphen sat. That just gives it a label. It's handy sometimes when you wanna see which module is now acting on something. You always have the model tag. So that's the same. So now we have an instance of this. Now, just creating a Basilisk module doesn't do anything because it's not staged to be executed. So as seen in the fundamentals of Basilisk lectures, we now have to add this spacecraft Basilisk module to the task, this is the task that's gonna run an update every 10 seconds. So we'll get a 10 second integration time step uh, for the spacecraft dynamics. 
Good. So there's still several things missing. This will execute it, but we haven't given it in, uh, in the initial conditions, which means at the beginning, it'll just be at the origin, zero, 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 floating in deep space. There's no gravity. It's just going to sit there, do nothing, be incredibly boring. Right. So there's more we want to do. But this line sets it up. At least we'll make sure it gets executed. So now we want to do something more, right? We want to have gravity. So we're going to use from this library, uh, we're going to create this gravity body factory. It's a factory class. And um, here I've actually loaded it up already in this gravity factory class. You can go look at the code. Everything that happens here, you could do explicitly in your simulation code. It just gets a little tedious. And sometimes little tweaks happen, enhancements happen in how we set up gravity bodies or how we can label them or specify how they should look in wizard and so forth. Those are some recent changes. If you use the gravity factory, I just have to update the factory and every code that uses it automatically will get all the new features. So I really highly recommend using this. Um, the purpose of the gravity factory is we can create one or multiple objects, set them up, um, connect them, and then you have to connect all these gravity objects to the spacecraft. So the spacecraft is subject to Earth's gravity, Moon's gravity, Sun's gravity. Here, it's just going to be Earth, single gravity body. So a lot of talking. What do we do? We create an instance of this gravity factory class. It's um, just a class. And um, so grav factory is that class now. And next, we're going to call and tell it to create a particular planet. You can see here for the simulation, we had these flags, planet case. So if you gave it Mars, it's going to call create Mars Berry Center, which is a particular Mars model that will be created for you. Or if you create, if you set Earth, it would create the Earth for you in the simulation script. If you're curious what this does in PyCharm, if you do Command B, it puts you to the definition. And you can see it creates this gravity effector, grav body data. It's another class that's supported for gravity effectors. It basically contains all the information, like the name of the body, um, the mu, the gravitational constant. Remember, it has to be in meters, not kilometers. Uh, radius of the equators, also using meters, not kilometers. And um, it then, add, you know, so it creates this object, this instance of this class, this gravity data class, gives it a name. This is kind of useful, doesn't have to look, this, these are defaults we used because they kind of come from Spice. But the display name, this is what's shown in Wizard. If you don't specify this, it'll just show Earth planet data, which is kind of long and cumbersome. And sometimes you might have a lecture you're giving and you want to have one Earth and you give another Earth next to it and you want to show both and you might want to label one Earth and one Earth too. So um, display name allows you to modify that, which is kind of neat. So the default is just going to be Earth for Earth. Model dictionary key, this dictates for wizard what model to use. And it's an empty string, which means it'll use the default. So it uses that nice high res Earth texture with clouds and everything. But if you wanted to make it look purple, you can make it, you know, you can bring in your own stuff in wizard and specify the key there. So that's what that one's for. Mu and radius of equator, those are known that gives the size of the whole object. And then we have grav bodies, spice, it's the spice frame. If we do use spice, which we don't in this simulation, it would specify the orientation of the gravity body. And at the end, so, but here actually you can see it creates a dictionary list that we can look up. So the purpose of the graph factory is every time you call it, it goes, oh, you want a moon? I'm adding moon to my list. You want a sun? I'll add a sun to the list. And then in the end, we get this nice list and we can then just connect this entire list to the spacecraft and be done. And it goes, oh, all the stuff in this list, this spacecraft is subject to that. And that makes it really convenient in a moment. But we also want to maybe modify stuff. And you will see one instance of it. So we actually disown this. So this, this object will be alive after we leave this subroutine and we actually return it. So you can see here, I'm creating an Earth and the returned instance of that Earth data is stored in the variable planet. And there's another variable is central body. I want to set that to true. By default, it's off. Now, what does is central body do? Later down in the code, we have to tell the system what is the initial position and the initial velocity of the spacecraft. And then if you have 16 gravity bodies, the question is, is your position relative to the sun, to Jupiter, to Mars, to Earth, to which body, you know? So that's dictated here with is central body. 
So by setting this later on, when I specify the initial position and making it explicit, it is relative to this earth object, the earth frame. Now, so that's cool. So we got that specified. We've created an earth, we've done this. Um, now the next, if we want to use spherical harmonics, that was one of the simulation input flags. Then there's another flag here inside the planet, that earth instance called use spherical harm parameters. By default, it's off and I say, yes, it's true. And if it's true, you have to give it the spherical parameters, the spherical harmonic coefficients to actually simulate. And so Basilisk has a few of them by default, but you can run any of your own. And we'll look at this in a second. Um, and we'll load it up. I'm specifying them. I'm specifying where to put the parameters into spherical harmonics here. And I'm specifying the degree load up to degree two in this particular case. So let's talk about spherical harmonics. Creating Earth, you saw it specified mu. Mu is a basically dictates your point mass assumption of a planet. Radius of the equator, that's useful if you want to draw it, because then we know how big it is. But really, from a gravity perspective, it doesn't check for collisions with Earth. It just knows it's a point mass, essentially, a point mass model. If you want to have anything beyond the point mass model, we need something like J2 or the spherical harmonics. And your table of spherical harmonics typically includes the zeroth order, which is point mass, first order, which is typically zero if your coordinate frame is at the center of mass of the planet. Then you have J2, J22, J3, all these different parameters that come up and um, it loads it up there. So the first one, point mass, is already dictated. So if your table typically includes the zeroth order, which is also point mass, we don't want to double count that. So in Basilisk, when loading spherical harmonics and when it loops over the harmonics, it always starts out with first order, not zeroth order to avoid double counting. So while that line is in your file, it's not gonna be used. It's just a subtlety that you have to be aware of because Basilisk, if it had Earth, Mars, Venus, Jupiter in there, it actually solves the full multi-body, n-body gravity problem. And we need to know the point mass of all those different things. Um, and then we wanna be able to superimpose spherical harmonics, which we're doing as well. So anyway, a lot of chatting. If you're not familiar with what I just discussed, you may not be that familiar with higher order gravity models. So in which case, take that class first, then it'll make, then this will make more sense. But what is this, if you are familiar with spherical harmonics, let's look at this data file. If I open up this file, this is kind of what it looks like. And the first line contains basic parameters of the spherical harmonics. This is typically what you would see in one of those files. And we've kept exactly the same format as what you kind of standard. Um, so what you will see is the first one, number is actually your equatorial radius. And notice this is given again in meters here. We're doing everything in meters. Mu, also we don't use kilometers. We use meters when we specify mu um, is given here. And the rest of the numbers we don't actually use on that first line. Then if you look at your spherical harmonics, the zero zero term has a factor of one, which it has to be. That's your point mass model. And um, then that's it. And this is the line that will get ignored. We read it in, but later on, we don't ever loop over that one because otherwise we'll be double counting point mass models. First order model, you can see the coefficients here are all zero, which makes sense. If your center of mass of the planet is at your origin of the planet coordinate frame, then the first moments vanish. So that's what you have here. The first non-zero term, is J2, which you would have. This is the terms you would then read in. And you could pull out these coefficients. If you had J21, J22, they're set to zero here. J3, I have a line for it, but it also set to zero. So they're not specified. Um, that's what this simple text file does. So now when we read it in up to order two, it would reload it up, including these, but not the third one and uh, specify that. So in this simulation, if you turn on spherical harmonics, you will just get pure J2, that's it. But just a quick understanding of what these things are, especially the units. I know in orbits, we tend to use kilometers, but we do spacecraft dynamics, relative motion, and spacecraft shapes and dimensions are never specified in kilometers. This may be specified in meters. So we do everything in meters, just so we don't mix kilometers and meters and have to <coughs> maybe miss a conversion somewhere. Okay, so if we have spherical harmonics, we now load them up, and this is what you would have to do, and that's it. 
afterwards, in either case, planet.mu, that was one of the parameters that's specified by the create earth function here. This one gets saved off and that's just done for plotting purposes. When I'm plot, I like to plot my reference orbit and show where I'm actually on with my integrated orbit. And uh, so just for convenience, I'm saving that off. You know, This is up to you what you wanna do. We've created now a gravity body. What we haven't done yet is connected the gravity body to the spacecraft. Um, the spacecraft, it has things called effectors and gravity also acts like an effector. Effectors are things that affect the dynamics. You can have thruster effectors, reaction wheel effectors, just external force torque effectors, but also gravity effectors. And not just one, but a whole list of gravity. It solves the full multi-body problem, which is pretty slick actually. So how do we do that? This is the one line that does it. So inside space object, inside the spacecraft basilisk class, there's a thing called grav field and within it, it's a variable called, or a list actually, it's a vector. Um, it's a, called grav bodies. How many grav bodies do I have? And it needs these grav body data class objects, instances that we were specifying earlier. So in this sim, it's only one, but this line is nice because you can repeat the same line no matter how many grav bodies you have. So inside the grav factory, grav bodies, Right here, this is your dictionary list. Dot values pulls out all the value, all these gravity body instances, and it creates a list. And this method here is a swigging thing. It takes this Python list and converts this into a C vector that we can stash in graph bodies. That's a C vector of graph body data. So this is the one line. This works for one body because it just pulls everything that's in that dictionary list. If you did both create Earth and Mars and Venus, which we'll do in a later example, you would have multiple bodies and everything's attached. Now here's the cool thing that you can do in Basilisk. Not every spacecraft has to be subject to the same gravity fields. What does that mean? Well, that means you may have one spacecraft simulated due to gravity of Earth, and another one is subject due to gravity of the Earth plus the gravity of the Sun and Mars. Maybe you want to see what the influence is of those two bodies on a low Earth orbit. And it should be small, but it'll be non-zero. So you could have one spacecraft you know, subject to one set of dynamics, another spacecraft set to three grav bodies. And so you could um, you know, just send one of these objects to the one spacecraft and all three objects to the second spacecraft you've created. So we don't often do that, but it is a capability that's actually pretty slick. So not every spacecraft in your simulation has to be subject to all the grav bodies that were created. Um, yeah, typically if we do a long simulation, I go from Earth, depart, fly by Earth, Moon, go by Venus, swing up to Mars, I just include all the graph bodies. This is C++ code, it's so fast, it really doesn't make much of a difference to include one or four. So if I'm doing a long trajectory past all of them, I just include all the bodies at all times. Um, then I never have to worry about turning off one, turning on one, what's that error due to that truncation? I just have them running all the time. But for comparative purposes, I can see a real value in having one subject to two and one subject to five bodies, for example. Anyway, so now we've got graph body. Now, when we've done graph body, that's all we're gonna do here. It seems suspiciously simple. Where is this earth? We haven't specified where earth is and we don't anywhere in the code. So by default, when you say create earth, the graph body data class has a input message that if it's connected, it'll read from that message that says, okay, the earth is now in this location and moving in this direction. And it gives it all the proper ephemeris information. If that message is not connected, which we're not doing here, so what happens? Well, if it's not connected, then all the position and velocity and orientations of the earth are just set to zero, zero, zero. And for orientations, you get just the identity direction cosine matrix. So it means the earth orientation is coincidental with the inertial frame that you have for this simulation. And that's it. So here earth will actually be at zero, zero, zero. In other simulations, Earth will be 149 million kilometers in some direction because we're actually including sun and the earth and multiple graph bodies. So you'll see that later. But for now, we created earth and just remember if you create earth, it's at the origin. If you're curious and you create earth and Mars at the same time, both of them will default to be at the origin and you're creating a simulation where you have two planets superimposed on each other, both at the origin, which is gonna give you different behaviors than you might expect. So be aware of that. 
Okay, we've done planets. Next thing, spacecraft. We just created it. We didn't say where it is. So by default, all the states will just be zero. And that's not very good. Um, you know, gravity, one over r squared, and r goes to zero. That's not a good thing. So we have to specify, you know, some non-zero orbit. Otherwise, we'll have a singularity. So in the end, I'm going to jump to the bottom. The one thing we have to do is this line. In spacecraft object, there's variables. There's a hub, which is really your main rigid body. We can also attach later on hinged things, hinged panels like solar panels flexing or reaction wheels and so forth. They all attach to the hub. So we need the hub's position and we're specifying RCN. So that's the center of mass of this the hub system is going to be at this location. And that's what's specified. So you need an inertial position vector and an inertial velocity vector. And we set the inertial position and velocity, the initial ones. The simulation will grab those. Simulation is pretty smart because later on, if we have a spacecraft and then we add a panel, a man panel has some other mass. So you've got a body and a panel and the center of mass will actually shift. Here we're specifying CN, not BN. C being the center of mass of this spacecraft system, not the B would be the body fixed location of the hub. Already complexity of frames, right? So you're specifying the center of mass of the spacecraft has to be at this location. So as you add other panels that shift the center of mass, it's automatically going to adjust the body position B such that the center of mass C is at this specified location. Just subtleties. Now, how do I get those? I, I could have just written, make this you know, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000 or something just to specify it. But I wanted the particular orbit. So I'm doing a little Python math to compute from orbit elements my position and velocity. And um, from the orbital motions, there's a, there's a class called classic elements, which specify A, E, I, all the classic elements in this case. So it's a convenience. I like to use those. I'm specifying my Leo radius, my geo radius. So now, depending on the orbit case, am I doing a geo, a GTO, or a Leo orbit? Like a Leo, this will get by default. You will see the semi-major axis is orbit radius. Eccentricity is really close to zero. So it's actually going to be a very circular looking orbit. I give it an inclination, um, uh, big omega, that's ascending node, argument of periapsis, and initial true anomaly. And notice that everything in basilisk must be set in radians. So I'm always taking my degrees and converting them to radians with this D to R macro, uh, just be consistent. And then I have orbital motions, which will element to RV that takes all my orbit elements, given this gravity constant that I needed. I, st I, st I stored that from my planet. It will convert and return position and velocity vector. So it's a convenience function. That's how I go from orbit element to position velocity. And this lets me set up my uh, essentially inclined near circular orbit. And then those values are stored into these CN in it. Quick thing on nomenclature. If you haven't read the nomenclature page about basilisk, vectors are nice. But in computers, we always represent vectors as matrices. That means we're looking at a vector represented with respect to a particular coordinate frame, right? Because a vector has an infinity of representations depending on which coordinate frames you picked. Here, R is a vector. It is the position of C relative to N, center of mass relative to the N is the inertial frame origin. And then underscore N, so this labeling as I have here, you would read it as the position vector of C relative to N expressed in N frame components. This way we're sure. And RN here, same thing. This is my position vector in the N frame. So you want to make sure you put things all in the same frame. Uh, v, C, N, N, same thing. That's the inertial velocity vector of the point C relative to the point N in N frame components. There's a whole web page on nomenclature. You can go look at how to code for basilisk. So good. There are other things you can set. I've got it commented out, but there's, for example, this RBCB that you could set. It defaults to zero. You don't have to make it zero. Um, what it basically says is in your body, you know, you may have some inertias and everything, but in that body, maybe the body fixed point B is not the center of mass. It typically is, but maybe a CAD program used the lower left corner as your um, body frame point B. And now you want to have the, the system needs to know where is the center of mass of this body that you've created with this mass. 
and that is done here, you could then specify BC, which is the center of mass of the body B, the hub, relative to the body fixed point B, which in this case is not the center of mass. And it's in B frame components. Um, and by default, it's zero. If it's not zero, you could specify it. So again, a convenience. So um, you can set it up and it will do all the transformations and parallaxis theorems and everything else that's needed to do your dynamics. So cool, we're almost there, right? We're doing the simplest thing. Just we've got it. We're not doing attitude right now. We're just doing translation. We've got position, the velocity, um, the body, the body point B is the center of mass because we're not specifying anything else. Um, we still have to tell the simulation how long to run, right? That was one of the things from fundamentals. I'm going to do here either three orbits in, if I'm using spherical harmonics to show their effects, or I'm going to do three quarters of an orbit as I showed you in the one set. That's kind of the default. So I need to orbit period. I'm just using classic Python to do mu, you know, square root of mu over a cube to get the mean orbit rate. And then two pi divided by n gives you orbit period. That's all I'm doing here, nothing fancy. Depending on the simulation type, right? I either do a three period or a three quarter period simulation time. And I make sure the simulation time is set in nanoseconds because that's our fundamental unit of time for simulations. That's the smallest time increment. It's gonna just rip through. Next thing we need to do is specify what to record. Because right now we'd run, but not record anything, which would be, you know, like we trust the simulation, everything's working. We don't, we tend to not trust things we wanna see. We want proof, right? So we have to set up recorders. These are the two lines. This is from Fundamentals and Basilisk. The spacecraft has an output message called SC state out message. So we just do a dot recorder. And here we're actually specifying a sampling time. So we don't want it to record every 10 seconds, but we want to record maybe a different interval every 30 seconds or something. So often when we're plotting, I may know for this plot, I want to use about a hundred points. I don't want to have a million points because it makes a huge file. I want to have a nice small file graphic. Um, you know, that I can then save off and include in a paper. So in one case, I use 400 points or I want 100 points. And instead of then having to compute every time, what's this time step? Well, how long is the simulation? If I have a 10 hour simulation, I'm doing 10 second time steps and want to have, you know, 56 points ish. How often do I need to record, you know, every 10 seconds, every third time step, every fifth time step, it has to be an integer time step number. Right, because we don't do half time steps in Basilisk. It's always an update is 10 seconds, that's it. Um, so there's this sampling time that does this math for you. You can do it yourself if you want to, but in unit test support, this is a convenience function. I give it the total simulation time, you know, uh, three quarter an orbit or four orbits minus 10 second time steps. I'm looking for either 100 or 400 points and it'll tell me what's the nearest integer match with the simulation time step, that'll get you about this number of data points. So that's why we're using sampling time. Just to remind you, you know, if you just want to record it every update cycle and not every third or fourth update cycle, all you have to do is just remove, wait, I should have double clicked this. There we go. If you remove this and just do a recorder, then it'll record at the tasks update rate. But I'm going to put this back again. This last step, the recorder is actually a basilisk module, the data recorder. So we also have to add it to the task. So we have to make sure here that this gets called and it'll be called up to every 10 seconds. And it will see, should it update it and record it. Good, At this point, we've kind of finished setting up. We now have a spacecraft, we have earth gravity, we've connected earth to the spacecraft. We have set up the initial positions and velocity of the spacecraft. We have set up how long it should run. We have set up a recorder. We're almost ready to go. This line is really just about if you want to record the data and save it off as a binary data file that you can play back and visit three-dimensional visualization. So by default, the script has it, but it doesn't save it off and it doesn't do a live stream. If you do want to save it off, you just have to go to this line and uncomment it, and it will save it off. Now, this documentation on the website for enabled, you know, what all goes into this, but basically you give it the Basilisk framework, the task name, it's going to create something called a Viz interface Basilisk module. That Viz interface module will talk to other messages for you, pull the spacecraft data, where is the earth, record all of this, 
and then put it into this file. And then if you have more complicated things like sensors and panels and wheels, we would have to add that information to this command. But here it's very simple. So all we have to provide is the spacecraft object. You might ask, where is the earth? How does it know where the earth is? Well, it turns out because we've attached all the earth, the gravity bodies to the spacecraft in Python, in this script, I can dig into this and figure out, hey, this spacecraft is attached to these grav bodies and it'll do it all for you. So you don't have to specify the grav bodies. As soon as you give it spacecraft, I can figure out which grav bodies you were including and I'll do that for you automatically. If you have two spacecraft and they're each subject to different grav bodies, it basically figures out the union. It doesn't create two Earths if both of them are using Earth as a grav body, it just creates one, but it creates the union of all the grav bodies that each spacecraft used. This will save it to a file. So I'll go back here to Basilisk. And if I run it again, you will see there's an extra line that appears. Um, it actually tells you in the terminal, hey, I'm saving this off to, I ran the script from examples and it creates a subfolder called underscore viz files. And then it uses the file name and adds underscore unity viz dot bin to it. So that's where it puts this binary file. And you could launch actually a wizard and um, load up that binary file. Uh, we'll find it. This was scenario basic orbit. This is the one it just created. And I could play it back. Again, this is an orbit. Um, it's So there we go. Now we can see the spacecraft kind of covering three quarters of an orbit, and then the simulation resets. So that's what we saw in the Python plots. This is a nice cool 3D visualization playing back. So that's what we did there. So typically I don't have these uncommented. Live stream, there's a demo script that does this explicitly a little bit better, but live stream basically allows you to stream while the script is running, it'll keep sending wizard data. So if you're running a really long simulation and you just want to live watch what is happening in a three-dimensional environment, you can do that. So how you do that is you start wizard first. And instead of just selecting a file, what we have to do is uh, enter the socket address. And you will get that. Let me go back to here. We've got live stream. So if I go here now and run it, you can say warning, I'm waiting it's waiting for wizard to connect. So I copy this TCP colon forward slash forward slash localhost colon five, 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 six. I copy that one. And let's see, then I go to wizard. I paste that command. Want to make sure you have direct communication selected and live display selected. And then it's going to run the simulation. And you can see this basilisk is so fast. Wizard is still catching up. It just finished. So when it gets all this data, it plays it back frame by frame by frame as fast as it can. But it took it several seconds to play back. It took it a fraction of a second to simulate. So that's obviously not very useful right now in this particular simulation. There are modules that force real-time behavior. So the module does nothing but wait for one second to pass, and then it releases back to the simulation and uh, the simulation can advance. So you can make things like we have software clocks um, real time and then watch real time what happens or speed it up if you want to. Um, anyway, so a, there is live streaming that you can do as well. I just wanted to demonstrate that one time here. So I'm gonna uncomment that again. Good, so again, all of this stuff is not required. This is just things if you wanna save off to Wizard, which is kind of cool. I mean, Wizard is pretty neat. Now, as in the fundamentals of Basilisk, we've set up the simulation, but we haven't actually done anything yet. We've just set it all up. We need to still initialize it and we have to run it. So ask yourself, initialize simulation, what does that actually do? Well, it goes to every process, finds a task within that process, and then per task, it'll run through every module in that task, which here will be the spacecraft module, the gravity effector is actually in there. It runs updates as well to update the Earth positions if needed. We had the recorder, that was one. And if we have this interface, it's also a module. So there's actually several modules running in this simple simulation. This will initialize and call a reset on everything. Make sure everything is set up, clean, fresh, ready to run. 
we computed a simulation time. This was either three quarter of an orbit or three orbits. And so we configured the stop time for Basilisk and then we run execute simulation. This actually executes the three quarter orbits or three orbit simulation, depending on the case that you're running here. Once it finishes, we can then go ahead and pull the recorded data. Here, all the plotting I put into an extra function that does all the plotting. This is pure Python. I'm assuming you know Python. So I'm just sending it the stuff from the data recorder dot R, you know, in that message has some variables. It has a, a, a three-dimensional array for the position vector R, B, N, B, 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 B N in, in the end frame and R, B, N in the end frame, I should say. I'm just calling those out as pause data, velocity data. Don't have to do that. You know, here I'm sending it this. I could just as easily just have had this and sent that. That would work as well. It's up to you. But you now have the recorded data after you've finished running Basilisk and you're ready to just do whatever you want with this data. Plot it, manipulate it, do some checks, save it to a file, whatever. It's up to you. If plot show is if show plot was on, I would show the plots. Sometimes I run a unit test and I don't want tons of plots keep show, popping up. So in the unit test, show plots is turned off. By default, all these scripts have it turned on. And then in the end, I'm a good citizen, close my plots and I return some lists for, this is, this is all just done for uh, documentation. So you don't have to do that in your scripts. It's just done for these particular scenarios. Anyway, this concludes scenario basic orbit. As you can see, if you just run this in its default way, you get the orbit. This was a three quarter around earth and we can run some stuff. If we would switch earth to Mars, which you can do here and I run it again, it's gonna give me an earth, Mars orbit. And in the plotting, I actually check what's the planet case because then I draw Mars reddish brown instead of green, just to show the difference. I'm still doing my validation and showing inertial coordinates, but you know, you get now a low Mars orbit instead of a low Earth orbit by just changing that one flag, but I'll put that back. Okay, hope this was helpful. Um, there's always more documentation and more things you can say, but I'll have other videos for some of these other scenarios that will hopefully be helpful. Thanks.